Hi, everybody. This is Akiko, music director of the Mid-Texas Symphony, and I am here today to talk about our uh, upcoming concert season finale pictures at an exhibition on Sunday, April 28th at Jackson Auditorium. Uh, with me today is um, my esteemed guest, a pianist and composer, Grace Shushot. Uh, for those of you who, are, who might not know, um, Grace is a pianist and a composer who lives in New Braunfels. And um, the Mid-Texas Symphony commissioned her uh, to write a brand new piece for us. Um, and it's called the Hill Country Concerto. Um, and Grace is also going to be the piano soloist for this piece. So um, it's really exciting for the symphony to not only play the great, you know, masterpieces of the past, but also be expanding the canon, at, you know, so to speak, to be creating, helping create new work. So welcome, Grace. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and delighted uh, to be here. Yeah, we're really excited about this world premiere that's going to happen. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, yourself. How, um, how did you start on the piano and how did you start composing? So when um, I first started, um, I was still living in China um, in the uh, in Tianjin, which is um, a little bit, um, it's about two hours drive from the capital. And my mm -hmm. parents, they were both professors at Tianjin Conservatory. So um, I was brought up in that environment, in the conservatory environment. And my father was my teacher for the first 13 years. And um, I studied piano since I was four years old under his guidance. Um, and my, my family and I, we um, it's so it's we we un, we they love their jobs in in Tianjin. It was a wonderful job, and they both I could tell they both loved that job where mm -hmm. they nurtured young musicians from um, the middle grade, middle age, a uh, middle group, middle school grade up until the high school years. Um, and it was like a, their family. Unfortunately, it was. Um, during the Tiananmen Square that mm. it happened. When that happened, um, it was very traumatizing for many, many Chinese. And uh, my my parents saw the first opportunity they they got to to make a move to the to America. And it mm. was very important for us to have religious freedom. We mm. were Christians in China, which mm. is very rare. There was um, we were born again. Uh, we met in a very small room with one other professor from the conservatory, and we could not tell anybody that we were meeting. It was very secretive. My parents, they taught me the Bible. They, they were very faithful, and, that, um, uh, and I saw that, that their faith in motion. And we decided, well, my parents <laughs> decided to, to move to America. And this is the first time in China, Chinese history since the Cultural Revolution mm -hmm. that allowed um, Chinese to to leave to uh, to to not it, it, because of the Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot more flexibility because mm -hmm. before that it was very much closed off. It was very rare that you you have you would have these you would be presented with opportunity to, to go abroad. And my father decided to pursue graduate studies in music in America. So we made the move um, and it, in, it, in itself, it's a journey and, and it's a huge new environment for myself and for my parents as well. It was much easier for me um, than my parents. Um, and this, this journey just had, just traumatic. Tra I mean, there was so much um, gratefulness in my heart when I, you know, when we started our lives here and, and just seeing that America is really, you know, what it's claimed to be. It's, it's a country of the free and, um, and we can worship our God openly mm -hmm. and we can open the Bible and we can read the Bible. We could uh, proclaim we could share our faith with others without being prosecuted 
Um, and that was the other thing in, in China when my parents were um, teaching there. There was, if you said anything about Christianity in your workplace, even sharing it with your coworker, you're, you're done for. You take your stuff and you leave and there's no jobs. There's, you, you basically are evicted and um, from, you know, from where you are and banished, so to speak. So it was a very cruel, cruel environment in, in that regard. Um, so, and, uh, you know, another thing that in, um, you know, in China, in Chinese, uh, the, the name for America means beautiful country. Mm -hmm. um, and when we came here, uh, my father was just telling, I heard him, overheard him telling my, uh, our new American friends um, that, you know, this really is a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just in its beauty, but the people of the country and, the, and, the, and just that you're able to worship God and, and being able to do it freely. And that's amazing. So, and, and that translates into my music. And it naturally does because I try to depict that freedom in, in the music. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I use that allegory, not allegory, well, what do you, I compare it not in terms of just literal sins, but that, that idea of captivity that, you know, mm -hmm. in, um, um, long, you know, in the 400s BC, the, the Israelites, they came out of cap captivity from Babylon. Um, uh, and that's, that's written in, in Psalm 126, when they came out of captivity, they were on their way to Jerusalem and that journey, it, it was like a dream. And by the way, the title of the piece, uh, the, the, the subtitle is Like Those Who Dream. Um, and if you look at Psalm 126, there's um, a line in that chapter that talks about this is like a dream for us. Um, mm -hmm. And our mouths are filled with laughter. It's not just, oh, we're happy but we're filled with laughter and our tongues uh, are with joyful shouting. Uh, it's no joke that this, you are actually coming out of captivity. And this is what I experienced mm. um, in a, in a, you know, in an environment that I, I think that that really did a lot to me as a person co coming from a communist um, country for the first 10 years of my life mm. and experiencing that um, just the contrast between a, a free country and in, in a communist country. And it is just so different. And there's so many stories, even in my family that you, if I told you most Americans would not even believe because it's just so tragic, you know, that the personal lives that were shattered in into pieces um, just because of, you know, a, a government in that just, um, so, yeah, so when, when I wrote this piece, that was obviously part of my, you know, experience in coming mm -hmm. into a, you know, a new, um, I, I guess when I, a lot lost, so I was telling you about the, just how, how grateful I was in my family that we made the move. Um, and there was a lot of joy, but at the same time, it was really hard. <laughs> as you can see, I mean, I'm sure that you can relate to that as well. Um, just being a new immigrant um, mm -hmm. with nothing. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was an only child, mm -hmm. um, um, but that also it mirrors what I read in Psalm 126 that it's not, it, you know, all of that joy doesn't come with, um, you know, free. It doesn't come free. Mm -hmm. it, it comes with tears and it comes with, you know, weeping. You know, it says those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. And he who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed. Mm -hmm. And you're still trying to sow. You're still trying to plant seeds in the, while, while you're in captivity, but once you're free, you're still have, you still have to work to get to that journey. That journey is not the end. So, so, so in the music itself, 
there is a dichotomy of that joyful shouting, you know, that happy, you know, that you can't even describe the kind of joy that you're experiencing in the Lord because the Lord delivered you from captivity in Babylon. And there's also struggling, that struggle Mm -hmm. of just, we've got to do this every day. It's not an easy life. Nobody promised you to, to be, you know, to, to, to have everything. So you, you have to work, you know, it, but it's worth something because, you know, because the glory ahead of you is so much greater than the pain in front of us, the pain, the, the, the momentary pain that you go through every day, you know, it's, it, it's, everybody experiences that. Um, So there's a clear dichotomy in that music in, in terms of, how you, you know, you're going to, you're going to hear pain in there. And there's going to be a part where it almost sounds like a funeral march. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a war in there, just like there's war going on. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's war in Israel right now. And there's that we, you know, we, we are weeping with them, but also there's war going on in your hearts, in, in our hearts, in our souls. Uh, and that's always that is always that dichotomy of yes, there there is hope and there is that glory ahead of us, but in the meantime, we've got to keep fighting. We've got to keep fighting for this, um, to you know to keep going. And, and so so this whole this whole concerto was written in Texas, right? <laughs> A yeah. new you know, my beginning for you and your family. Yes. 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 Well, thank you for sharing so much uh, personal and and passionate view, you know, and sharing so much about your past life. And uh, I think the audience is really in for a treat to hear this passion from you unleash in the music. So I just wanted to prepare the uh, audience a little bit uh, by telling them a little bit about the logistics. So, I know the piece is about 16 minutes in total. I know it's a piano concerto. It's in one movement. So it's continuous 16 minutes of music. And it's for you, the pianist, and the Mid-Texas Symphony, the orchestra. Um, And uh, so, you know, I think a lot of people already know this format. Like the Rhapsody in Blue is about the same length, you know, by Gershwin. Um, so we've, we know this kind of format, but we don't know your piece yet because it's brand new and we're giving mm-hmm. it a premiere. So um, let's just give everybody a little bit of a preview. Um, I know that it starts uh, very um, kind of simple and leisurely in a six, eight time, very and peaceful. And there's sense mm-hmm. of humor here and there. And then um, it's kind of a walking tempo until um, the piano starts pounding these 16th notes and there's this incredible drive and energy um and uh, you describe in the program notes that everybody else uh, will read at the concert um that how you know the conf- the conflict is created so tell us a little bit about a couple of the musical um motives or uh, we don't have to sing them or anything or play them but you know what and I hear a lot of jazz influences. So tell us a little bit about what people can expect. I would say uh, you would um, are in for a ride in terms of just it's a it sounds like you're going on a journey, mm-hmm. and it starts off in a way that is very unassuming, yes, um, and something that is simple. Um, but then there's always a sense of direction. So uh, directions yeah. and contrasts are very important to me. So you'll hear this is leading to this and there's a goal. Um, just like, you know, when you're on a journey, you have, you've got to have goals. You've right. got to have a destination. So destination is really important in terms of uh, where, you know, our, w- once we've arrived, we've got, you know, things to, to take care of. So there's always a sense of direction in, in, my, in, in the way that I um, imagine music to be in terms of that. And there's also just that uh, contrast of, mm-hmm. you know, dynamic contrast and, um, and, you know, having some polymeter in the beginning 
to drive the piece into the development section. Now, this is similar to a sonata form. Um, mm. So I really, really um, was debating whether I wanted to be a through composed. While I was composing, I was even debating. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I arrived at the conclusion that, yes, there's there's needs to be a, a recapitulation. So yeah. you'll, you'll hear some kind of a recapitulation. Yes. So it's not completely through composed. I think you do you remember that conversation we had about, oh, this should be through complete. I, I remember you were right. thinking that. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. You know, for um, so that's not a forum um, for those of you who may not have taken music theory in college. You know, there's a beginning the exposition and that exposition music takes kind of a meandering um, journey in the development section where it does get developed. And then at the end, um, like Grace said, there is a recapitulation. So return of the exposition material, but it staying in the home key and kind of more settled um, with a finite ending. So we, as a listener, experience this journey from the beginning, you know, beginning, change, and then coming home. Um, so it's interesting that you decided to go kind of yeah. go with that but of course you know the sonata form was born um it was really codified in the 18th century um and i think everyone is influenced by sonata form including you and me um because we all studied it and a lot of our bread and butter you know repertoire is in the sonata forms but i think um composers such as yourself you know since then have made it their own and just given it their own um, spin on it. So I think it can be a combination of the sonata form and the sense of journey, you know, not necessarily coming home, but going right. somewhere like the journey, the inner journey that you were experiencing um, both, you know, as a child in your personal life and also um, as a musician. And it sounds like you're still on this journey. I can feel your drive for life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I know that you studied at USC in California and you studied at Indiana mm -hmm. University in Bloomington and yes. then you moved to New Braunfels uh, with your husband and children. Um, mm -hmm. So you've been on a journey, um, you know, moving from different, you know, state to state, even within the United States. Um, so you have certainly been on this journey and also from pianist, being a pianist to composer too. So you know, I can feel it in your voice and um, I can also see it in the music and the score that I've received. Um, and not just, uh, you know, sonata form music, music and sonata form usually have two contrasting themes or, you know, it's rarely just in one kind of mono theme um, kind of deal. So in your case, you have the jazzy, bluesy, relaxed theme and then you have this incredible, uh, dr driven um, music, fast paced music, you know, that goes to all kinds of different places and gets loud and soft. And then um, in the Psalm 126 that you quote um, in the program notes, I was struck by, you know, the word joy at the end. I know the concerto is an alternation of joy and sorrow right. because mm -hmm. life is both, but I, it sounds to me like the piece ends in joy. Am I right? I would hope so. I would, you know, because it, it really does have that, uh, um, the, the, the drive of it going into the, you know, the uh, cadenza and, and it's supposed to, to, to conclude. But what I really am hoping is that there would be a second movement and a third movement, um, because this is just part of the, part of the journey. <laughs> um, the yes. So, journey. Yes. I yes. really do think it does have that joy in the in the end because that's what we're all looking forward to. One day there will, you know, one day there will be all joy, and yes. there won't be too much pain anymore. So yes, it's definitely that drives um, yeah. the joy ele element. But as you, but the important thing really is that there, the joy doesn't exist without all that struggle. Yes, they wouldn't make your joy as joyful if you didn't struggle, <laughs> right? right. I That's think everybody can relate to that. Everyone struggles. And, that is and so well put. That's very apt. And I mean, I think people who come to listen to this piece will really be able to hear that. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, listening to this, our chat today, people can expect both, 
joy and conflict and the peace and and the drive and, some, and, and things in between you know so something things that, that could be in the gray area that yeah. that's you know that is yeah and it's so difficult to express that in music but yet music is the perfect vehicle um in many ways because he has the ability it's ephemeral but he has the ability to transport us from one place to the next you know emotionally and i think that's what your piece does and you know, 16 yeah. minutes. And because it's one continuous movement um, without a break, uh, it really is a journey um, and it feels continuous. Um, so right. we are very excited to uh, perform it with you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next weekend. And I know uh, the audience will be very excited to see um, a composer, a creator uh, from their own area. So thank you so much uh, for joining me. And uh, we'll be seeing you very soon, Grace. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. See you oh. on see see you when I do see you next week. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Grace. Well, that was a very dynamic um, conversation with Grace Shushot. She is the composer and the piano soloist for the Hill Country Concerto, um, which we will be premiering. Um, giving a world premiere um, on April 28th. Um, I'm really excited after hearing her talk so passionately about um, her past and what, how that transferred into this new composition. So let's talk about the other two pieces, the old pieces. Um, they come from the late 19th century and they both come from Russian composers. And um, I think it's very apt that um, Grace uh, wrote this concerto inspired by her locale because our first composer of the evening, uh, Borodin, um, also wrote about a very specific place and expressed what's special about it uh, in music. Alexander Borodin um, was one of the five composers that were nicknamed the Mighty Handful or the Five. Sometimes, once in a generation, there comes a group of composers, usually young composers, that are forward thinking, that are progressive, that are creating something new, like Lissis um, in France. Um, and in Russia's case, uh, it was the mighty handful, the five. And two of those composers are represented on this program. The first one is the, uh, Alexander Borden, and the other one is Modest Mussorgsky, who uh, we will hear about a little bit later today and wrote pictures at an exhibition. Um, the five included the two of them, plus Rimsky Korsakov, um, who wrote Scheherazade and many other great masterpieces that we know and love, as well as Bala Kirov and Cesar Kui. Um, now let's start with Borden. The first piece you will hear on this program um, is called In the Steps of Central Asia. And this is a seven minute tone poem so it's uh, not a symphony, it's not an overture, it's a poetic piece that depicts a feeling or a story or um, some sort of an affect. Um, and in this case, um, he is talking about a scene, a tableau uh, that takes place in Central Asia. Now the Mighty Handful or the Russian Five, they were known uh, to promote Russian folk culture in their music, as well as realism. You have to remember that this was, they were popular, they were coming to the fore in the late 1850s until about 1870. Um, so this is still, you know, the mid to late 19th century. Um, so the Russian composers, um, there were Russian composers like Tchaikovsky, who was more traditional, was conservatory trained, um, kind of very traditional, uh, professional musician in the industry. And uh, he wrote music a little bit more based on Western European tradition, the Central European tradition, like the German romanticism. Um, but the Mighty Handful were a little bit different. They were Russian also, like Tchaikovsky, but they were less academic in their training as musicians and composers. In fact, most of them had day jobs other than in music. Um, and um, maybe that made them more free to be more 
expressive or as explicit in their Russianness or use of folk music and also being realist, which means um, instead of a dreamy, idealistic idea that was very popular in romantic uh, music history, um, period, uh, they were more interested in expressing the real human um, qualities, even if it's not pretty. Uh, so, or they were interested in expressing things in nature, things that were happening in real life. So on the steps of Central Asia, Central Asia um, has a lot of steps. It's not S-T-E-P-S, but S-T-E-P-P-E-S, which uh, is a large area of flat grasslands. Um, and um, this, is, this tableau is about a caravan of Central Asians passing through uh, under the protection of the Russians. And uh, in music, the two sides are represented uh, by different instruments. At the beginning of the piece, you will hear a beautiful, peaceful melody uh, that sounds like a Russian folk song played by the clarinet and eventually passed on to other instruments. Uh, cantabile, singing, uh, very beautiful, a uh, piano, very soft, beautiful. And then you will hear a more exotic sounding instrument, the English horn. The English horn is a cousin of the oboe. So it's a double reed instrument, looks like an oboe, but at the end there's a big bulb. And they are tuned a fifth below the oboe so they can cover the alto range, whereas the oboe covers a soprano range if they were in choirs. Um, and the English horn takes uh, the Central Asian song. And this, is, this was Borden's idea of the Orient, um, the exoticism. And um, the English horn plays this other theme um, that is very... Um, beautiful and sinewy. Um, and so that expresses uh, the Central Asians uh, going in his caravan. And to express the caravan itself, uh, we have pizzicatos from the strings, the plucked strings, um, describing the hoofs um, of the horses um, and uh, how they're just chugging along and pulling the caravan. So this piece is about a journey across Central Asia, across these steps, and these two groups, different group, contrasting groups of people traveling together. Um, and first you'll hear the two themes separately, but at the climax, you will hear the two themes joining together and it's a magical moment. The piece starts soft, as I mentioned, and the piece starts end soft, which means you hear the caravan coming from far away in front of you. And it, it's the loudest when it passes in front of you. And then when it's soft, it means they're going away in the far away place. So this is a beautiful seven minute piece uh, on the steps of Central Asia by Alexander Borden. The other piece by uh, on this program is the big finale of our season. Um, Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition. This is one of the greatest, uh, most popular orchestral masterworks. And I say or orchestral, but I have to preface that by saying Mussorgsky originally wrote this for the piano. And the reason it's for an orchestra is because this piece, pictures and exhibition for the piano was so effective that it inspired so many composers and arrangers to orchestrate it for a full orchestra. A pianist has 88 keys to play with and it's one instrument, but they have to draw a lot of different colors out of it to make a whole piece. Uh, they have to be the orchestra. So pianists are used they are very used to imagining um, different colors. They, they must come up with different colors using the same instrument, uh, one instrument to express so many different expressions. So um, this piece by Mussorgsky really called for coloring. And uh, I think there are about 50 different uh, versions of orchestrated pictures and exhibition. Uh, but you are going to hear the most popular one by Maurice Ravel. Maurice Ravel, of course, uh, is a great composer uh, himself. 
we have heard his mother goose sweet this uh, excerpts from it um, this season um, you'll hear a big piece by him next um, season next fall for the season opener and uh, of course he, he's one of my favorite composers uh, and he's French and he's so good at different colors it's a master orchestrator on top of being a master composer so Mussorgsky wrote this in 1874 and Ravel orchestrated in 1922. And it is just beloved by so many people and it is the most popular version uh, played by orchestras today. Uh, although there have been other versions um, that are sometimes played uh, and uh, you'll see why, because the technique color that he employs is a real um, miracle and it's a, it, gives everybody in the orchestra something interesting to do and it becomes a big tour de force for the orchestra especially principal trumpet who has big solos throughout um so let's talk about the music musorgsky wrote pictures and exhibition um based on um uh, exhibit that he attended of his deceased friend victor hartman hartman was a russian artist and architect slash designer who died very young at age 39. And he and Mussorgsky were very good friends and Mussorgsky was absolutely devastated to learn his death. Um, soon after his death, uh, they had an exhibition of his work and Mussorgsky attended it and he was inspired to write a piece where he expresses himself in this theme, um, by this theme, uh, where he he depicts himself walking around the art gallery, from walking from this artwork to this room to that artwork, um, and in between he intersperses um, music inspired by ten pieces of artwork by Victor Hartman. Now let's talk about the music about Mussorgsky himself. He calls it a promenade, and um, it's what starts the piece and you will hear it in between different movements, as I mentioned. And um, it has a Russian quality uh, because of the interval of perfect fourth. Da, 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 da. That is very prominent in Russian folk music. So dum, bum, bum, da, da, da. that da, da, is a perfect fourth and that makes it Russian, um, as well as the chorale, the Russian chorus. The, first promenade um, begins with the principal trumpet intoning this dum, bum, bum, ba, da, da, theme and then it's echoed by the, the brass section and then eventually the rest of the orchestra. It's very majestic yet simple um, and it's a little bit lopsided. It's not in an even meter um, even though the tempo is very steady and apparently it's because Mussorgsky by this time in his life in his 40s was a little bit portly and he was a little bit wobbly um, walking, and he, but he, you know, he has some heft to himself. Um, so he wasn't just scurrying around. Um, he wasn't a skinny guy scurrying around. So um, he's just walking stately uh, from room to room and kind of admiring the artwork by his late friend. Now this promenade, you want to memorize or you want to learn what it sounds like because the later promenades will be subtly changed or not so subtly changed in both um, harmony and uh, orchestration, instrumentation um, to match what happened before and what happened after. So they become transitional material from one painting to the next. Um, so they really help us kind of get from one artwork to the next. It's very, very lovely. Um, so we really want to pay attention to how the promenade theme itself morphs throughout the piece. Now let's talk about each painting. I said there are 10 paintings uh, or designs of Hartmann's that uh, inspired Mussorgsky. They didn't all survive. Um, I have some of them to share today, um, but... Um, a lot of them have been lost since Hartman's death. But thankfully, uh, we have Mussorgsky's music to, um, you know, kind of imagine what the paintings might have been like. The first painting is called The Gnomes. 
Gnomes um, was a design for a nutcracker uh, that Victor Hartman uh, created. And it was of a gnome on crooked legs. And um, appropriately, it's a very creepy movement. After the stately majestic opening promenade, suddenly we're thrust into this um, stormy, very brusque movement and very creepy. Um, it features the low strings in the orchestra, um, but everybody else uh, participates eventually to contribute this kind of horror movie-esque uh, music. The second painting is called The Old Castle. And the old castle um, is a medieval one that Hartman painted. This painting is lost as well as known. And uh, it's apparently an Italian castle. So Masorzi starts off with a Sicilian rhythm. Dum, ba-dum, bum, 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 ba-dum, bum, bum, bum. And then for the role of the troubadour singing, Maurice Ravel picks the saxophone. The saxophone is not used very often in orchestral music. As you know, there's just a handful of pieces that feature the sax. Um, but in this case, it is the melody and a beautiful melody it is. Apparently, um, during Victor Hartman's career, it was very um, common to add a human being next to a structure, a painting was structured for scale. Uh, so the troubadour is sort of on the side um, of this painting, um, kind of giving us a sense of um, the awe that he's feeling toward this big medieval castle. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous. And Ravel tells the saxophonist to play with vibrato. So very singing quality, um, not a straight tone with a lot of expression. The next painting is of the Tuileries. Uh, Tuileries is a garden in Paris across from the Louvre uh, Museum. And apparently Hartman did a study abroad uh, for three years in France. So actually that's why a lot of his paintings and subsequently a lot of these movements are based in France this being the first one. Um, this is a scene that he depicts where a bunch of young children and their nannies are in this garden. And the piece starts with um, motive that sounds like um, the children kind of whining. And some say that this was inspired, or Sorgs was inspired by the Russian word nanny, nya, 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 da, da. And that's how it starts. Um, in the middle, there is a, kind of a different theme that sounds like the nurses are kind of gossiping and talking amongst themselves. But the music returns to the music of the children, um, maybe quarreling, maybe um, having fun, playing around in this garden. The next movement, um, after another promenade, is called Beadlo. Beadlo is Polish for cattle, and Hartman's wife was Polish, so he spent some um, some time in Poland throughout his life. And um, this uh, is a painting about an ox cart. So this ox is pulling this cart with humongous wheels, um, and um, it is kind of a lament, um, very, very sad song uh, played by the tuba. Uh, in modern orchestras, it is usually played by the euphonium, which we all have because it's in a very high uh, range for um, some, today's symphonic tuba. So we will have a euphonium player playing this melody for Beadlo. It's very ponderous and sad. Uh, and um, you can hear the huge wheels of the ox cart turning, uh, played by the low strings kind of incessantly. Dom, bom, 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 bom. And in Ravel's orchestration, which was inspired by Rimsky Korsakov's edition of Sorsky's piano piece, it starts soft. So it sounds kind of like the Borden. It sounds like it's coming from far away and it gets really loud and it goes away um, by getting soft again. So this is a very, very, um, this is one of my favorite movements, I think, the beadlow. 
The next painting, um, we finally have a picture for that I can share. Uh, this is the actual um, work by Victor Hartman. This is um, ballet um, costume. Uh, let me make sure that I have this up. Um, this was created for um, a ballet called Trilly B. Um, this was a, Petit, a Maurice Petipa um, ballet at the Balashoi. And um, here we go. Here is the. Hmm, I'm not sure why it's not. Oh, there it is. So this is the next movement, Ballet of Chicks in Their Shells. Um, these are young dancers in this costume for this ballet. Yes, they are wearing eggshells, upside down eggshells with holes for their arms and legs. And on their heads are helmets that are shaped like canary um, heads. And this was um, Victor Hartman's design for this costume. So uh, finally, we have something where we have the artwork uh, that inspired this music. Um, the music heavily features the woodwinds uh, to describe the clicks and clacks of the burrs. Um, it really does sound like birds um, clacking their beaks. Uh, it's very fast and uh, it kind of um, it's over in a wisp, uh, but it's very challenging um, to play for the orchestra, but very virtuosic. Uh, in addition to the woodwinds, we have the harp and the plucked strings. So a lot of plucked sounds, um, perfect for birds. Um, we have another painting uh, available to show, and that is for the next artwork. This is commonly known as Samuel Goldenberg and Schmoyle. Now, there is a debate about whether the, this, these two artworks were actually what um, Mussorgsky was working with. Um, but let's share it. Mussorgsky originally titled uh, this movement, Two Polish Jews, um, Two Jewish Men of Contrasting Nature and Statures. Um, and then it is believed that um, somebody mistakenly attributed these two artworks as the ones that um, Mussorgsky was referring to when he wrote this piece. But um, this is as close as you're gonna get, I think, to the origin, so let's go with this. Um, so these two paintings are two separate paintings, um, but one expresses the rich Jew and the other expresses the poor Jew on the right. Um, and uh, I'm sorry to say that Mussorgsky was anti-Semitic, um, as was the case with a lot of people at the time um, in his environment. And uh, this is a caricature, uh, a musical caricature of uh, the rich and poor Jews. So the music for the rich Jew, Samuel Goldenberg, um, is very arrogant, pompous, with a full string section, very juicy strings fortissimo, very strong. And then, then when we move on to the music of um, Shmoyle, the poor Jew, um, there is a trumpet with a mute on to sound very whiny and um, as if he's shivering in the cold. And then just like in the Borden, uh, we hear their two themes intersect later in the piece. Uh, so they happen simultaneously, even though we'll hear them separately at the beginning. So another very popular and powerful technique to show the contrast uh, between them. And um, it is almost as if, you know, Mussorgsky was saying that these are two sides of the same uh, person, that, you know, they could be in all of us, uh, the rich and the poor, um, arrogant and the humble. Um, and Mussorgsky was definitely not shy from expressing all things human, whether it was good or beautiful or sad or um, ugly truth about humanity. Um, so this is that movement of two Polish Jews. Um, the next one is another French movement, uh, but instead of Paris, this is from Limoges. 
uh, and it's subtitled The Marketplace. The Marketplace um, is where Musorti put a lot of gossiping um, townspeople in his, this musical story. And apparently he did write a story uh, that goes with this movement, but scratch it out later. Um, and that story, um, even though he didn't want us to know, I think it gives us a lot of clues about what the music was. So this music is very fast paced, high energy, hyper, um, and rightly so. So he his story is that a bunch of French uh, women are gossiping about Mr. So-and-so who lost a cow uh, recently, but then his cow has been found. It was found yesterday. No, it was found the day before yesterday. Okay. you know kind of fighting, um, quarreling among themselves about who's right about such you know, details of a gossip. And then um, they also talk about somebody who lost their dentures, uh, their fake teeth. And then they also talk uh, are talking about um, a man who has a red nose and clearly alcoholic. So this is just town's gossip at the marketplace and in Limoges, and it's very active, fast um, and biting. Sometimes the music sounds like people are hitting each other or yelling at each other, um, but it's another very virtuosic movement for the orchestra. Okay, so the next three uh, pictures, we do have the artwork for, so I'm excited to share them with you. From this chatter of the French women gossiping in Limoges, we go straight into, um, kind of a whiplash into a completely different world. And this is the catacombs. This is another French movement. Um, this is painting of Victor Hartman and a friend with a lamp in their hands, looking down in the Roman catacombs underneath the city of Paris. And this is very, very um, creepy and ghastly music. So let me share that image. Yes, so this is a catacombs um, painting um, or artwork by Victor Hartman and Mussorgsky's music is, um, I think this is, I, I keep thinking every movement is my favorite, but I think this is the my favorite, personal favorite movement of the whole piece. Um, and Ravel's orchestration is so amazing. It begins with a big chord from the low brass section, which is echoed by an, um, the muted French horns, and they go back and forth, loud to the echo, loud to the echo, and the harmonies are so um, gut-wrenchingly beautiful. And um, this loud, soft stops, and it everybody joins in to kind of do a big uh, crescendo and welcomes the principal trumpet um, to play this one short melody that sounds like someone's crying out. Now, this starting with this movement, Mussorgsky's obsession with death and maybe death of Victor Hartman, his friend, starts to really um, come alive. So obviously catacombs, they're looking at skulls underground and it's very ghastly scene. This movement is followed by a version of Promenade by Mussorgsky, um, where it's very um, atmospheric uh, with the first violins shimmering at the top with this tremolo, high pitched sound like in a horror movie, followed by a very uh, sad, pathetic uh, woodwind choir kind of intoning kind of a orthodox chant maybe. And then this is titled um, with the dead in the dead language in Latin. And uh, Mussorgsky said, um, well, may it be in Latin. The creative spirit of the departed Hartman leads me toward the skulls and addresses them. A pale light radiates from the interior of the skulls. So the previous movement was about Hartman and his friend looking at the skulls in Paris, in the catacombs. Now this promenade is about Mussorgsky's own reflection of that scene that Hartman depicted. And he is basically projecting his own feelings about death and Hartman's death um, in this promenade. 
Now, this atmospheric music is suddenly interrupted by the next movement, Baba Yaga. Um, so let me pull up that artwork. The Baba Yaga um, is also called a hut on um, Fowl's legs, F-O-W-L, uh, Fowl's legs. And this was um, Hartman's design for a clock. Um, so let me share that design. Okay, so this was Hartman's design for the clock. Now, Baba Yaga um, is a Slavic uh, folklore um, figure. Um, she is a witch uh, who lures victims into her hut. Um, and um, she grinds them up in a mortar <laughs> with a pestle. Uh, and the mortar is also her vehicle for flying if she needs to flee somebody. Um, and apparently uh, this hut is, it stands on a um, fowl's legs uh, so that it can rotate and uh, just open up um, whenever a likely victim comes near uh, the hut. So very grotesque and the music is extremely exciting uh, in a grotesque way. It'd be perfect for Halloween. Um, and um, it's kind of a pounding, um, consistent rhythm um, like clock, but it has bells and it has some music that sounds like she's flying in her mortar with her and you know, holding her pestle instead of a broomstick. Uh, she's flying in a mortar uh, in the chase. Um, so it's very exciting music. And um, so we've had a few very dark, grotesque movements. And then when this, I don't want to say car chase because it's a mortar chase, that when this mortar chase ends, suddenly we're thrown into the final movement. The final movement is called the Great Gates of Kiev. And this was Hartman's design on he was also an architect. So this was a design that he um, entered into competition um, for. Um, and uh, there was a celebration of um, Tsar Alexander's uh, escape from assassination. And so they were soliciting designs uh, for a gate that was very Russian and um, patriotic. And this was Hartman's submission. And he was very, very proud of it apparently. So here it is. This theme, um, it almost sounds like the promenade. So I hear this last movement, the opening of the last movement with the brass chorale as sort of finally Mussorgsky and Hartman merging as one person. At the beginning, Mussorgsky was an observant and um, just spectator of Hartman's artwork at his, this art exhibit and thinking about his friend. But as we progress through the piece over the course of 30 minutes or so, I feel that he got so uh, invested in his friend's artwork and especially with the movement about the catacombs followed by the death um, promenade, um, you really kind of start to see the two of them coming together as one person. And I think that this last movement is the musical representation of the promenade sort of influencing the great gates of Kiev music. So it starts with this beautiful, uh, amazing chorale by the brass section and the entire orchestra joins in eventually. Um, there are bells, um, like church bells ringing, a lot of percussion, harps, um, very, very beautiful music. Um, but it is twice interrupted by a very stark and somber and expressionless that is something specifically, you know, instructed by Mussorgsky uh, music. And it is a church hymn called As You Are Baptized in Christ. So he quotes this um, hymn played by uh, clarinets and bassoons twice um, before he returns to the all the bells and whistles of the great gates of Kiev again. So it's a very triumphant ending. And I think the triumph is in the celebration of Mussorgsky's friend. Uh, it's the best eulogy that anyone could ask for, um, for a deceased friend, I think. And uh, Hartman, I think he's, I, I hate to say it, but I think 
Mussorgsky's music really contributed to his notoriety as an artist. Um, at least those of us in music, uh, but not well versed in visual art, would not know who Hartman is if it weren't for Mussorgsky's contribution. I kept mentioning um, Maurice Ravel, and I must say that without Ravel, Mussorgsky's piece also would not be as prominent to the general public and those of us who listen to orchestral music specifically. So um, this, and of course, Rimsky-Korsakov had a lot to do with editing and kind of cleaning up and sometimes changing, um, you know, which is kind of looked down upon these days, but you know, he was trying to help his friend uh, kind of smoothing out Mussorgsky's work. So there are a lot of different players um, in this music and, um, it took all of them to make this great piece of music come alive to us um, in the concert hall. So I'm really excited that we're doing this and it will feature everybody in the Mid-Texas Symphony. Of course, our principal trumpet, Andrew Janak, um, most of all, and he will be great in this, but the whole orchestra will really be featured throughout the piece. Uh, and it's just con continuously uh, boom, goes boom, boom, boom from each movement to movement. Every movement is just a, few minutes of a vignette really so it'll go by fast um connected by the promenades uh so i'm really excited and i want to thank all of you for joining us this season and making the 23 24 season so incredible so thank you so much for your support and being there we look forward to seeing you one more time before the summer and uh we're so excited about the 24 25 season we have a lot of great uh concerts coming up next season so Thank you. Uh, we'll see you on Sunday, April 28th at four o'clock at Jackson Auditorium in Seguin. Bye-bye. <laughs>